A warm welcome to our panelists and attendees of the webinar, uh, Holistic, Sustainable and Resilient Recovery of Cultural Heritage Following Disasters and Conflicts, held as part of ECROM lecture series. Please to introduce myself, Rohit Jigyasu, Project Manager at ECROM. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, ECROM, the International Center for the Study of Preservation and Restoration of Cultural Property, is the intergovernmental organization working in the service of its 137 member states for promoting the conservation of all forms of cultural heritage in every region of the world. Although disasters and conflicts are a cause of great misery and irreplaceable loss of heritage, they also serve as opportunities for change through the introduction of bold policy and planning measures that are aimed at reducing the vulnerability of people, properties, and cultural heritage to future disasters and conflicts. The challenge indeed is how to achieve this while also protecting heritage values to the best possible extent. So uh, now we have some critical questions in front of us. And uh, the first question would be really to find out what will be the basic policy governing the interventions to cultural heritage undertaken as part of the recovery process? Also, what should be prioritized for recovery and on what basis? Only monumental remains of the past or living heritage that shows continuity while evolving and adapting to change? Or we should, uh, or we should also think more than that. How can we reconcile the need to safeguard lives as well as recovering lost heritage values, especially those that contribute to, uh, to giving local identity and sense of place? What are the challenges and opportunities, failures and success stories in achieving this? What are the possible approaches for recovery of different types of heritage within its extended scope and what processes should be followed for reaching a sound decision? And last but not the least, should heritage be considered only a victim of disasters to be protected for posterity or if it can also be a source of resilience through local knowledge and capacity. Uh, well, all these aspects are really important for us to, to really take into account while we design recovery of cultural heritage. Uh, there are important case studies that we need to look at in order to understand how this can be achieved. So through the case studies that we are going to present in this webinar by our panelists, we hope to consider the following three aspects of successful heritage recovery process following disasters and conflicts. So what is holistic recovery? Which means really in mainstreaming the tangible and the intangible heritage belonging to various sections of the community in the overall recovery process. Sustainable recovery. How do we achieve sustainability in the recovery process, ensuring that recovery process is socially, economically, and institutionally sustainable and does not create dependencies on external actors in the long run? And last but not the least, resilient recovery, which means enabling heritage as means of reducing vulnerability, building peace and reconciliation, and enhancing coping capacity following the concept of building back better. We are indeed privileged uh, to be joined by our esteemed panelists who through their presentations will present key lessons on cultural heritage recovery based on their experiences with specific cases. So I'm delighted to introduce you to our panelists today and request them to turn on their videos. Uh, Professor Haida Al-Hariti from the American University of Beirut and Research Director at Beirut Urban Lab. Welcome, uh, Professor Haida. Uh, Ms. Maria Rita Achestoso, Senior Project Manager Culture Unit at UNESCO Iraq Office. Uh, hello, um, hello, Maria. Mr. Kai Vaize, uh, President of ECOMOS Nepal. Welcome, Kai. Uh, Professor Paola Rizzi, uh, University of Sassari, Italy. Uh, welcome, Paola. And last but not the least, uh, Dr. Amra Hadzi Mohamed Vodovic, International Forum Bosnia and Director of the Center for Cultural Heritage. Welcome, Amra. 
Before I proceed further, uh, may I apprise you of some procedures for housekeeping during this webinar. Uh, you can send your queries and comments via Q&A uh, icon that you see at the bottom of the Zoom window. Uh, we will take up some questions after the presentations by our panelists. Uh, in case we are unable to answer the questions due to shortage of time, we will, uh, we will definitely respond to you in case you send these queries to us over email. And so now let's begin uh, without further ado. And I have the privilege of firstly inviting Dr. Haida Al Hariti, Professor of Architecture and Urban Design at American University of Beirut uh, in Lebanon. Dr. Al Hariti will be speaking on a people centered, heritage led recovery of the impacted neighborhoods post blast Beirut. So uh, over to you, Professor Al Hariti. Thank you, Rohit, so much. Uh, thank you. I will just take a moment to share my um, presentation. I hope you can see my screen and can hear me well. It's perfectly fine. Please go ahead, Ms. Okay. Uh, Great. Okay, um, I'd like today to, um, uh, of course, first thank you for inviting me to this wonderful um, uh, webinar and um, giving me a whole lot of seven minutes <laughs> to try to say what I want. So I will try to pack it here. Um, I, I'm re I really have a proposition today to first share with you the post-war reconstruction of downtown Beirut during the 90s and how the people are reacting and therefore what we should do in the post-blast uh, uh, Beirut of the, uh, after the port. So um, just to give you a quick introduction, of course, Beirut suffered a civil war from 1975 to 1990. And um, uh, a lot of its, uh, of course, fabric, urban fabric uh, was damaged and uh, impacted by the 15 year war. But um, it was really even more impacted by the reconstruction project itself. Uh, I'm not seeing my slides advance. Um, um, yes, we cannot see your next slide. So probably it's... Uh... A little bit of a challenge. Uh, would you like us to share your uh, screen uh, so that we don't uh, waste further time? What do you suggest? Um, I'm just hoping it's a delay. Okay. Uh, we, still, we are still on your first uh, slide. Uh, Professor okay, Weber. okay, it's moving now. Okay. Okay, these are images that uh, are images from the civil war. After that, of course, there was the establishment of a private real estate company called Solidaire that took charge or government has rendered charge over to it to develop downtown after the war. Of course, much of the work was about images of this nature that are uh, a product of the Tapula Raza approach that was adopted by Solidaire and caused a real erasure of memory uh, images that people could not relate to and places that were demolished during the reconstruction. 70% actually of the de demolitions took place during the reconstruction uh, of many buildings that were still standing after the war. And you see successive in the map waves of demolitions um, throughout the 80s and 90s. What was left is only the black uh, part of the map. So the reconstruction project was self, what itself was a, a, a destruction, but not only of the built fabric, but a destruction of memory, which is really important when we talk of cultural recovery, we talk of connecting people with place or reconnecting people with place. Images like this were alien to the people, this Hong Kong of the Middle East that was being produced, replaced Beirut uh, that they hold the memory of, that is about Sahet al Burj or the Burj Square, the souks of Beirut that were open and inclusive of all, affordable shops, transportation hubs, theaters, um, and so on. Uh, these were all um, uh, called for for the people, of course, who took an opposite extreme, which is very nostalgic. But what turned the tide in the master planning process was the archaeological excavations when these buildings were demolished and the uh, buildings on their sites began, much of 
ancient Beirut surfaced and forced a rethinking of the process. But all that Solidaire did was to see how it can integrate um, the so-called traditional and heritage site into this neoliberal framework of investment to sell these places as high-end exclusive sites and neighborhoods and integrate fragments of a history into the so-called ancient city of the future without really having any meaningful relationship between the archaeological finds, the old fragments, into a real um, living everyday practices by the people. They were simply showcased and framed within, again, an, an exclusive framework of development, which created further social rupture, um, which was also, again, a, a result of the lack of a participatory strategy and a comprehensive framework with cultural heritage in mind. Everything was seen through the investment paradigm and was seen to enrich the uh, investment return. Uh, it ended up being about high-end malls, high-end neighborhoods, exclusive uh, shops uh, that are designer shops and not really souks as is this one. The souks were turned into an urban mall, not really accessible to all and affordable by the majority of people. The cultural layer was totally ruptured and the memory that people held of Beirut had no place to be projected onto these new projects. What ended up happening is a ghost town that after a short bubble, uh, the uh, people was abandoned, the place was abandoned, the people who invested in it were buying offices and apartments only really to invest in them. So it was not an inhabited active cultural space that was downtown. This was further exasperated by the policing and the fencing to protect the parliament and the government Sarai from the uh, reoccurring um, protest. So there was a process here that opened the door for a fantastic reaction to the people. And I take here an example of the socio-spatial practices or the uh, uh, spatial tactics of the revolution that happened in October of 2019, when the revolution unfolded People took to the street from all walks of life, began to reclaim these spaces, particularly the open spaces that are charged with their memory, such as Riyadh Sulah, Martyr Square. They established informal markets, established tented cities, uh, inscribed on its walls, and tried to reclaim it by so many different tactics, uh, such as uh, the occupation tactics from the tents, to playing yoga on the street, to domesticating the, sp the spaces, to turning them into informal markets of exchange. It, these are tactics of reinscribing their memory and claim onto the site. They even tried to change the name, to reclaim the old name of downtown, which was called Al Balad, by inscribing this in Arabic all over. So again, um, I'm reiterating here that revolutions are intensely place contingent. These people were not there by accident. They chose to be in these spaces because of um, the memory they hold of these places across several generations, even if it was an inherited memory. They also used performative tactics to reclaim the cultural layer of the city which Solidaire failed to reintegrate from artistic paintings, performances, debates in tents um, about the place and the imagination of what it should be, uh, reclaiming cultural icons, reclaiming the waterfront, which was privatized by Solidaire, sitting underneath signs that says, don't swim and don't fish, and really reclaim what was totally privatized and uh, which was uh, alienated from the everyday practices of um, people from all over. My favorite example is of the old Beirut theater, which was an icon of Beirut's cultural peak in the 60s and 70s, uh, which was abandoned, was planned to be demolished uh, by Solidaire, but then it was frozen. People started setting up performances right in front of it. This is an opera performance by the Music Academy, uh, people inscribed inside of it, meaning we want bread, education, and theater. So these are the various tactics. 
What I'm trying to say here is that the kind of erasure or collective amnesia that the process of the so-called reconstruction did was reversed by the spatial practices of the revolution in which people tried to relink with these spaces. And it's very important to say here that linking people to place is very critical for the sustainability of cultural um, heritage, both tangible and intangible in these cases. Of course, all these lessons that we've learned, we are trying now to channel to the uh, reconstruction or what I would like to call recovery after the blast of the port in August of 2020, a blast that took the engine, the economic engine of the city, which was close to downtown Beirut uh, and damaged and impacted many neighborhoods that are the periphery to the center um, and caused loss of heritage, loss of life and loss of a lot of the culture and also uh, spaces that the city held dear. So uh, what we are trying to do in the Beirut Urban Lab with my colleagues is to reconceptualize urban recovery in a way that takes into account uh, the whole a holistic approach that Rohit spoke about. So, but for us, urban recovery is, is beyond restoration and regeneration. It's not a post condition either or a physically bounded process. It's a process that is at times even intertwined with conflict and violence. Uh, it's a rupture that's a time created by planning exercises like I showed you with Solidaire. The reconstruction planning process was itself a cultural rupture. So um, we claim that in its extreme form, it's a process of reconfiguration that addresses all urban vulnerabilities and injustices. It's an opportunity to investigate how spatial, social, uh, cultural and imaginative dimension of urban existence are included and translated. These imaginations that I try to capture in the spatial tactics of the revolution. So we operate within a framework that is bottom up, participatory, socially just and inclusive. In our project, we envision a people centered heritage led and place specific therefore. Um, in, in the recent ad, uh, response to the post blast, we created a, a tripartite project with an observatory of what people are doing in terms of reconstruction and an actual implementation of a neighborhood scale recovery and an exercise that envisions the city as a whole. I'm going to take one minute to share with you what we're doing with the urban recovery at the scale of the neighborhood, which is community-based, which starts with training the local researchers within the paradigm of citizen scientists we include them in collecting the data, analyzing it, and co-designing with the community a framework of recovery through workshops uh, towards a shared vision uh, against which we design with the community a framework. And we use the CDS model to do that, which is the City Sustainable Strategy model. But all the time, we are really casting these narratives that we're giving voice to the people to cast their narratives and to um, really even imagine together what the future of their place should be. I'll stop here because I'm running out of time and happy to elaborate during the question and answer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Veda, for your elo eloquent presentation. I think you have given us a lot of things to think about. Uh, and I'm sure there would be many questions that will come up after your uh, in very, very interesting presentation. And as you pointed out, urban recovery is neither a post condition nor a physically bounded process. It is indeed intertwined with displacement, politics and power relations across temporal and geographic moments in your own words. So recovery is therefore a process of reconfiguration that responds to various urban vulnerabilities and injustices. And this has to be addressed while we design and implement the recovery process. Now I am pleased to invite our next panelist, uh, Dr. Maria Rita Achestoso from UNESCO Iraq office to make presentation on an integrated approach to the reconstruction of cultural landmarks in Mosul in Iraq following massive destruction due to conflict. So uh, over to you, Maria Rita. Uh, thank you, Rohit. Uh, just uh, a moment for me to share the screen. Can you see my screen? 
Yes, it's perfect. Uh, you just have to put the screen yeah. on. Yeah, perfect. Okay. So, uh, good morning or afternoon to everyone. Um, uh, in fact, I'm here presenting the uh, ongoing work uh, of UNESCO in the old city of uh, Mosul. Uh, so uh, the city of Mosul, meaning the linking point in Arabic, has always been characterized by a multicultural and multi-religious context, which is very well reflected in its urban landscape that is made up of uh, mosques, but also churches and synagogues. Unfortunately, the conflict started in 2014 and ended in 2017 has, has not only left the city in ruins and of course the population it needs, but it also tried to erase uh, this important spirit of mutual tolerance that the city has always been having historically. So uh, the case uh, presented today, um, it's implemented uh, within the framework of the UNESCO initiative revived the spirit of Mosul that our director general, uh, Audrey Azoulay, uh, launched in February 2018 in order to respond to these needs. This project funded by the Ura United Arab Emirates um, started in 2019 and works specifically on the rehabilitation of monumental landmarks in Mosul as a tool to foster reconciliation. Uh, now, uh, looking at the topic of the webinar and considering the limited time of seven minutes um, and looking at the three uh, key concepts informing the webinar, uh, I will try to mention how uh, the project tries to align to these three con the key concepts briefly uh, in practical terms. Uh, I will start with resilient, uh, highlighting how culture can become a means to building peace and tolerance. Um, in fact, uh, a decision was made uh, for the project to work simultaneously on a Muslim site, uh, the iconic Al Nuri complex with its Al Hadba minaret, um, and then, but also on two, uh, oh, sorry, but also on two um, Christian sites, the Al Tahira Syria Catholic Church and the Al Sa uh, Church. Uh, this is not only a way to send a clear message of mutual tolerance and hope uh, against the extremism brought by the conflict towards the recovery of the true spirit of the city, but it also gives a day-by-day -day possibility of contact, contact and dialogue through uh, a shared uh, work and objective in the daily implementation of the project. Uh, the second key aspect is uh, holistic, where culture is mainstream to various segments of the community, and not only in its tangible form, but also intangible. In fact, the project, which of course focuses on the, on the, on the physical reconstruction of these damaged landmarks, is also a continuous uh, component of community engagement, which tries also to revive the living culture of the city, which was very much important um, for, for Mo in Mosul. Um, so in this component, the cultural life is revitalized as a moment of recovery of collective memory and creativity. Here you can see an example of an initiative that we did uh, back uh, uh, in October, 2019, unfortunately, of course, the COVID impacted many of those activities. Uh, and this is a book festival that we did um, in uh, collaboration with uh, a local uh, cultural NGO. Uh, and it was symbolically convened in what was before the war, uh, the, the so-called book, uh, book street in the old city of Mosul. Um, the third uh, key uh, concept is, of course, sustainability, uh, which is very much important in the UNESCO uh, mandate. Um, I will use the example of the work done so far uh, for the uh, Al Nuri uh, complex. Uh, of course, an important component of contribution to sustainability and skill development is the implementation of targeted training. And in fact, uh, under the project, Rohit will mention that uh, more in detail at the end of my presentation, we are uh, um, launching now 
a two-year targeted training program uh, in collaboration with ICROM uh, exactly for uh, skill development in the old city of Mosul. But in addition to that, uh, we are always trying to um, ensure that there is an effort uh, of sustainability in the, I would say, in the daily activities of the project through continuous collaboration, direct involvement of local actors in the actual implementation of the project activity. And of course, in addition to targeted training, trying to offer continuous occasions of on-the-job training. Um, for example, um, in the initial phases of the mining and rubber removal, uh, we had to face the problem of, on one side, a very complicated technical case requiring um, high, uh, high levels of expertise. Um, and on the other side, the idea and the willingness of starting since the beginning to involve uh, the local professionals and workers and partners as much as we could. This is just a slide that shows you uh, the situation that we found uh, for the prior role immediately after the destruction in, uh, in 2017. So what we did, uh, we basically relied on international expertise in order to produce the design, especially for the uh, temporary stabilization of the remains of the mosque and the minaret that needed to be integrated with the operations of rubber removal and the mining. But this design was not just given to uh, the local stakeholders as something done and imposed, but we had continuous discussions on site, even during the decision-making process, I'm saying during the development of the design. So you can see here, for example, uh, a meeting with um, uh, in our site office. Now, uh, since the beginning, we also paid attention in having all our partners on board and directly on site with us. So since the very beginning, we have uh, decided to um, liaise, especially with the Ministry of Culture, but also in the case of the Al Nuri complex with the Sunni Endowment, uh, which is of course the owner of the, of the complex, to have um, staff uh, from their two institutions always on site with us. This, of course, um, helped in building a relation of trust, uh, in controlling the process, in taking decisions day by day together, um, and also in having all the different rules um, decided uh, at the very beginning of the process. For example, uh, all the work of the historical fragments a massive number recovered through the process of rubber removal were directly cataloged and inventoried by archaeologists from uh, the Ministry of Culture working with us as part of our team. And that's a photo of the beautiful work that they did on the bricks uh, from uh, recovered from the uh, Al Habba minaret. Uh, now, as I said, the, the, the case of the temporary stabilization was very, very complex. This is just an example of the design done for the pillars that were meant to support the dome, especially on its uh, western side. That, that's the photo that you can see. Well, all these structures were very complicated were actually uh, implemented by, executed by local carpenters. You can see the pillars during the construction. And what we did was just to deploy one very highly qualified international expert who provided them with uh, like uh, um, on the job trainings at the very beginning. And then they um, acquired skills, additional skills in order to proceed uh, by themselves. Um, this is a, a photo of the mosque, how it looks like now after all the operations of temporary stabilization and, uh, and, uh, and uh, rubber removal. Um, this, of course, created an occasion of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, creation of creation of jobs uh, for the locals, but it also, um, how to say, make them feeling uh, empowered 
and making them feeling part of the process since its very beginning. Um, now, we are, of course, trying to keep this strategy for the ongoing and next phases of the work. Here you can see the same methodology applied for another very important phase on the Minaret, which is the installation of the, uh, of the monitoring system, where again, uh, one international expert trained our engineers and then they proceeded by themselves in keeping installing uh, the, the, the remaining sensors. And, um, and on, at the bottom, the, um, the, 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 the other uh, field investigation, specifically the horizontal code drilling to check the stratigraphy. Uh, so uh, this means uh, basically um, uh, building uh, a sense of ownership and empowering them as actors of change, um, creating job, and of course, ensuring that the project can, can create at the maximum extent occasions for skill development, which we think are aspects at the core of sustainability. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Maria, for your uh, interesting presentation, which actually brought out how this initiative led by UNESCO has embodied holistic, sustainable, and resilient recovery uh, in its whole process. I'm, I'm sure there will be many learnings from us as the project moves into subsequent phases. Here, I would also like to mention, as you already mentioned in your presentation, that ECROM is indeed proud to collaborate with UNESCO in this project through a two-year capacity building program for young building professionals and craftspersons so that they gain necessary skills to contribute to heritage recovery process while gaining much needed livelihood opportunities. This has been definitely achieved as was already mentioned through financial support of United Arab Emirates and European Union. Uh, now I have the pleasure of requesting Mr. Kai Weise, uh, president of Ecomos Nepal to throw light on the lessons learned from his valuable experience of working on the recovery of cultural heritage following the devastating 2015 earthquake in Nepal. So uh, may I now pass the floor to Kai, please. Yes, uh, Kai, we can see your screen. Maybe you are, uh, yes, it's fine. You can go ahead. Okay, okay so greetings from Kathmandu. Uh, my presentation is coordinating stakeholders during post-earthquake rehabilitation in Nepal. Um, you know, this is a, a big topic. Uh, I'll keep it short and stick to just a few points. Um, this title uh, image shows uh, the community from the neighborhood of uh, Hanuman Doka in Kathmandu, uh, helping carry uh, one of the central posts of Kastamandap uh, in the process of rebuilding the monument with the living goddess uh, Kumari blessing the event. We cannot uh, predict earthquakes, uh, but in a seismically active zone, we are always awaiting the next one. This chart from uh, prepared in 2005, uh, which has mapped out earthquakes along the Himalayas, shows a slip deficit or lack of movement in Western Nepal. Um, so considering um, that we have major earthquakes uh, impacting Kathmandu every 80 to 100 years, and the last large earthquake was in 1934, uh, we started preparing. And uh, so we had various workshops and, uh, uh, and symposium and started discussing how we can actually be prepared for the next earthquake, uh, which then actually took place uh, on 25th April, 2015. Actually to our surprise, even though we were preparing uh, you're actually never really prepared for such a, a big uh, event. 
And uh, so on, uh, in 2015, we had the 7.8 magnitude Gorkha earthquake uh, that devastated large uh, parts of central Nepal. Um, the earthquake devastated monuments uh, impacting the Kathmandu Valley World Heritage property. And uh, we found out, you know, analyzing the, the destruction that uh, uh, more or less uh, it was due to the lack of maintenance and inappropriate interventions uh, that was the main cause for the destruction. Uh, for example, we have uh, previous interventions using uh, reinforced concrete uh, that was aging or was not compatible to the rest of the, the, the historical structure. And also the deterioration of material, uh, especially the timber joints. Uh, so there was also the, the lack of, uh, of uh, maintenance, which then points out to two main issues. One is, you know, the managers. How do we actually deal with uh, the managers of heritage? The other is the experts. And uh, here again, we have the big discussion of uh, the traditional experts, uh, the artisans, and uh, of course, uh, the more contemporary experts uh, who were involved in, in, these, uh, uh, in these monuments uh, previously. Now, mapping out the stakeholders, I mean, I've been working on this for the past two years. I'll keep it very as simple as possible. So we have, of course, different groups of stakeholders, or we can call them communities. And once you start looking at them more in detail, you get a very complex uh, kind of a, a setup. Uh, and the point here is that uh, each of these, uh, these sort of uh, subgroups uh, they, they're sort of different ideas on how we need to deal with, uh, with the heritage, uh, especially after a disaster. Uh, so, for example, we had uh, sort of activists getting involved uh, in respect to, uh, for example, the reconstruction of the Kastamandap, uh, the, the monument shown in the middle, uh, which collapsed during the earthquake. And uh, the, the real big divide was between uh, those who wanted to rebuild using traditional technology and materials, and uh, those who actually wanted to introduce modern interventions. And the interesting aspect here was that we had the government, even and even international in uh, those from the international community, who actually wanted this more modern interventions to be introduced, of course, uh, in an appropriate manner. But the local communities did not want that, and the activists actually fought against it and said, we want our monuments built back as they were previously. Now, this brings up, of course, a lot of questions. Um, in respect to the, the, the stakeholders, again, here we have uh, sort of the, some of these groups of stakeholders. Uh, and uh, this is uh, in connection with, again, Pastamond, the monument uh, uh, that collapsed. Uh, on the top left-hand side, we have a uh, um, community that is sort of a commercial community selling uh, flowers in front of, of the monument. You can see the work going on in the back with the bamboo scaffoldings. On the top right, we have the religious community that came and performed rituals. Uh, during also during the process of uh, rebuilding. Then below to the left, we have sort of the technical committee uh, and to the right, we have the artisans. And of course, uh, during this whole process uh, of uh, reconstruction, we had uh, the, the issue of how do we communicate between these different community groups. Um, one of these dialogues that we really worked on was uh, in connection with uh, between the traditional and uh, sort of the, the, the modern, uh, which was uh, sort of a, a critical aspect of how we actually approached uh, the reconstruction of this uh, monument. And uh, to the, uh, the image on the bottom left, we see uh, the head carpenter of watching skeptically as a, a timber sample is being removed uh, for scientific research and dating. And the, the image in the middle is, uh, again, uh, the, the head carpenter trying out a resistometer to, to check 
the quality of uh, one of the old timber brackets. And the interesting thing is, of course, that he traditionally actually knocks on the wood and he more or less can tell whether the timber is good or not. But uh, it's sort of the whole question of this dialogue between the traditional and how can we actually introduce uh, you know, modern methods or, or the communication became very important. On the other hand, we also have in, had engineers actually uh, you know, doing structural modeling and comparing what the artisans were actually proposing to what uh, we had, uh, you know, the, the ideas or the concepts that arose through the modern engineering approach. However, the, the monument would never have been rebuilt without artisans. So even if we have these, uh, the expertise of how it should be built, uh, you know, through engineering, it's actually the, the artisans who are the ones who ended up rebuilding the monument. And uh, in respect to Kathmandu, we, uh, you know, we're in a, uh, luckily we still have this continuity and we have traditional artisans who can, uh, you know, build uh, with uh, brick and mud mortar and also, uh, you know, know the timber, uh, the traditional timber joinery. Um, now, in connection with the international impact, uh, there are two sort of uh, questions I raised, but uh, of course, uh, it's part of a much more complex uh, communication between uh, sort of in the, the sort of the global dialogue. But I did want to mention two issues that, that came up in connection with uh, the international involvement, especially in the Kathmandu Valley. It's the post-disaster needs assessment uh, that was uh, prepared uh, as a rough assessment, uh, but was later used to tender out projects to the lowest bidder without any further planning or detailing. So in a certain sense, it, the, the, the PDNA was misused uh, to simplify the process and tender it out. And very often it led to a, a lack of understanding and inappropriate uh, reconstruction being carried out. So possibly the PDNA system would function, but it needs to be followed up by detailed uh, research and uh, more detailed uh, development of the projects. The other is the concept of build back better, which uh, again, uh, sort of uh, often led to strengthening of monuments, uh, introducing uh, sometimes or quite often inappropriate interventions without really understanding the traditional uh, structure. So even monuments that previously didn't collapse, and we know that the traditional structure uh, would have been, uh, you know, fine uh, if it had been maintained properly, uh, were rebuilt, uh, introducing sort of new interventions, which we have also understood that very often was the cause of damage because of the lack of uh, uh, compatibility between the new interventions and the traditional structure. Um, coming to sort of a, a, a conclusion, uh, the, there are two sort of ideas that, uh, that I'd like to present. One is we need to look at uh, heritage in the sense of continuity. So, uh, you know, looking at how it was in the past and how we ensure this continuity. And it might be something that we need to look at beyond conservation and our, you know, sort of conservation. Very often we look at something, uh, sort of freezing something in time. We have difficulties understanding how we're going to do this. But whenever we get the communities involved, it's a question of how do we actually ensure that these communities uh, sort of live their, uh, their, their cultural heritage and ensuring this, uh, the, the, the continuity of these. Uh, so even the built heritage is linked to the communities uh, and uh, their festivals, their beliefs, their skills, their knowledge. And on the right is adaptation. And uh, so resilience, uh, you know, can be seen in the possibility of adaptation of cultural heritage. Uh, and uh, to the right, we see a young woman who has started working uh, on uh, wood carving, which is a prof profession traditionally reserved for men. But it's through this kind of adaptation that, uh, you know, continuity can be uh, assured. So. Again, it's not really conservation, but I think we should be uh, focusing on continuity uh, to ensure that, uh, you know, in, in respect to resilience and uh, even post-disaster uh, uh, recovery. So thank you very much.
<clears throat> thank you very much, Kai. Thank you uh, for your uh, interesting presentation, which has actually clearly brought out uh, that uh, how important it is to really connect with multiple stakeholders, including local community. And it is not so easy because there would be differing opinions and there would be uh, different perceptions. So we have to really have this whole dialogue and reconciliation as we approach a process of decision making for recovery. Uh, you also emphasize the need for proper investigation and dialogue between modern engineering and traditional knowledge in order to build back better. And I think that's an important uh, uh, consideration that we have to always make while we uh, decide our recovery. Uh, now I request Dr. Paula Aritzi, Professor of Urban Design and Planning, City Lab, University of Sassari, Italy, who in her presentation titled Urban Cultural Heritage and Disaster, The Castle of Crossed Destinies, will be presenting the challenges for the recovery of L'Aquila in Italy following 2009 earthquake. So over to you, Paola. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, very well. Uh, you just okay. click the screen. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, great. I will try to, to keep in the seven minutes and I'm going to talk about this problem regarding uh, the reconstruction of an entire uh, historical territory, that is the territory of L'Aquila. Uh, just everybody knows that uh, Italy is a, a priceless uh, heritage site, but is also, however, a really prone uh, zone to different disasters and sometimes multi hazards. That means that, for instance, if you look to the map of uh, uh, earthquake, a uh, seismic hazard, and if you compare, for instance, I have not here, but with the dams, the big dams uh, of electric power energy production, you will see that they are uh, located in a strategic point. So if we look to the territory itself, it's really under risk and uh, the exposure is quite high of the population. And unfortunately, according with that, we have a sort of, uh, let's say, of habitus. Uh, to work always uh, um, in the post phase, so in the reconstruction rather than the pre phase, uh, because we say that, uh, let's say it's, uh, you know, every earthquake has a uh, very disaster, has its own, um, its own uh, nature, and therefore we have to, to look at it in a different way. But uh, I want to consider here what struck me really and make me really emotional once in 2019, we were visiting with the Japanese colleagues the, in September, North. Huh? And by chance, I jumped in a lady that I discovered was one of the restorers of the, the work in the Basilica of San Benedict Monument, that is the symbol of the, of the city. And uh, she said, a really in a really uh, empathic way, emotional, that very little has remained of what I have done in the recent years, because she was working in the in the restoration of the um, uh, North Church Cathedral for 20 years. And after 2016, 16, again, it appears that once more, we didn't consider the fact that the cycle of risk is uh, also concerning the cycle of uh, uh, urban city. I'm um, uh, just one quote more that is about the Friuli earthquake that is considered one of the uh, main disaster with the others in the 1980 and that uh, is considered a sort of a model. Uh, because it was uh, uh, following the concept of uh, reconstruction where it was as, as it was. But as uh, Professor Bataino pointed out here, uh, the center were rebuilt, but not the original population was there. And newcomers, uh, people that had no the same um, heritage that in the past. So the community has to learn uh, a bit more about what was the uh, the heritage there. So, and also this kind of uh, virtuous reconstruction uh, didn't delay the process of a territory that has spreading a lot of historical monuments, but uh, it was in a sort of transformation 
that uh, it was not considered after the end of the construction. So what happened in the 6th April of 2009, as many of you know, is a population of 70,000 people, L'Aquila, uh, that is the administrative capital of the Abus region, was uh, eaten by an um, earthquake of uh, magnitude uh, uh, 6.3. So um, the uh, let's say again, after the, the example that we have been passed, again, we approach as it was a new, a new thing without to think what was our, let's call it heritage of the past uh, in the reconstruction, in the field of reconstruction. So the first concerning was to, of course, uh, secure safety, provide temporary solution for public buildings and housing, and uh, there was no, um, let's say, um, no debate about the future of the city. So it was decided that the historical city center that was um, the core of um, not only of the local community, of the local um, economy, and because it was also um, housing um, a lot of uh, students, and uh, uh, it was, uh, let's say, revitalizing uh, the pattern at that time with a sort of green tourism. So it was to rebuild as it was, but with high technology, high, uh, let's say, I, all what the new um, discoveries in the reconstruction and the engineer can offer. So, and uh, the fact is that the aim was to build, to reconstruct the first, for the first time, an entire historical center according with the principle of uh, anti against um, seismic resistant cancer. Um, the, but what you can see here is that despite the fact that along, uh, you know, this, this part of the city, there was a center and there were different, let's say, polycentric city, uh, all the activity from here was spread and, and sprawl everywhere, emptying the, uh, the, according with the Progetto Case and all other um, measures that were taken top down by the government, um, it was, let's say, completely emptied. And uh, uh, still is uh, emptied, even if it's, uh, let's say, under a strong process of reconstruction. Um, the reconstruction was regarding mainly and uh, as an immediate measure, the private reconstruction. Uh, so what I can point out is that only in 2020, we start to think, and uh, there was uh, you know, uh, some process to start to rebuild the first school in the historical center. Because um, till now, all the schools that were uh, in the city are in the temporary um, structures. Uh, so the, the, the reconstruction of L'Aquila was completely a top-down approach, and it would be probably also the 2000, what is called the earthquake of Amatrice. And uh, this, uh, um, let's say, um, top-down approach uh, as a result, an enormous corpus of norms and laws, often in contrast, or that were difficult to combine together. Of course, participatory process since the beginning was left to just uh, activities and activists, and it was not considered like in the process of Emilia Romagna as a, a, a center. And, that led in how is in the picture that I, I took just two years ago in a, a blind and street, Strada Chiusa, closed end. Uh, here you have some example of uh, the private reconstruction that as you can see is following really high criteria, but um, um, let's say that this kind of recovery or better, this kind of reconstruction is not going to recover, is not giving us new way how to uh, revitalize the, the city as was in the past. And um, after 12 years, 
is um, this is um, the concept of to rebuild the city as it was where it was is uh, at the end only considering the physical space. So uh, the question that uh, often we arise as urban planner and designer is who is coming to live there, considering the fact that also there are new communities that arrive according with the fact that uh, the urban reconstru the reconstruction of the city, um, let's say drain a lot of um, human resources from abroad. So there are a lot of uh, migrants working in this. And there are some uh, new questions that, um, that is quite important, especially for the monument in the city. Uh, before the earthquake, when you work on the, on the you walk, sorry, on the city, um, this cars were everywhere, parked in the front of the main monuments. And uh, now the, there were more or less 12,000 uh, 12, of cars owned by the people that was living in the, uh, in the city center. So now this is uh, emptied by the cars and there is a big discussion also under the new plan, how to control and how to keep and preserve, for instance, the view of some important monuments for the city or part of the historical town uh, without um, uh, block their view by cars. So um, there are um, there was pointed before the principle of resilience, but the principle of resilience can work only if um, there is self-organizing and reorganizing capacities of the communities and of the stakeholders in order to. Uh, allowed to adapt to the stress of change. And, uh, um, and that's important because um, according with the top-down process, unfortunately, there is much rely in external aid, in external uh, provisions. And that, um, you know, it's, um, it's a bit it, it's a bit a problem for for the future and uh, uh, another um, meaningful activity was that in 2020 the basilica of Colimaggio restoration was awarded by the european award of restoration uh, heritage sorry award and uh, uh, in fact is a, a sort of uh, jewel of high tech and new technology of restoration that was also conducted by um, Professor Davide Galeota there uh, in monitoring the state of the, of the monument. But again, in my opinion, as an urban planner, the city is a sort of gestalt. You talk about holistic and this the approach that we have to consider, but. Uh, the city is a sort of vessel. You cannot see only one part without the other. You cannot see uh, this part without the, the, the intervention of the communities. And this is uh, something that I really love that was by a friend of mine, uh, an archaeologist that disappeared um, last uh, year. And uh, she was working. That was something that I prepared for the World Conference on Mosaic for her. And she was always talking about planning, program, project, and then conservation and discovery. So um, I think that we have to, uh, in order to secure resilience and resist the resistance is necessary to support process of inclusive re uh, reconstruction based on the risk awareness of the local community without to lose traces of the past. Thank you very much, Paola, for your presentation. Uh, you have rightly emphasized the importance of participatory processes to avoid conflicts and keep the solutions realistic compared to the decisions made and executed at the center level, which always leads to conflict and wrong estimations. And, and as you rightly said, recovery has to really point out at the future. And, and also, I think you made a very important point that you can't just look at one aspect of a city without focusing on the other because they are all interconnected. So thank you very much, uh, Paula, for your presentation. And now, last but not the least, uh, may I invite Dr. Amra Hadzi Muhammadovich, 
uh, in, from International Forum Bosnia and director of the Center for Cultural Heritage to speak on post-war reconstruction of Bosnian heritage, ferment of the social trauma processing. Uh, over to you, Amra. Thank you very much, Rohit. Uh, hello, everyone, wherever you are at, the, at this moment. The war in Bosnia came to an end with the International Peace Accord drafted in Dayton, USA. The very heart of the arrangements were Annexes 7, 6, 7, and 8, and all of them were dealing with the mutually interconnected issues of human rights, return of refugees and displaced persons, and cultural heritage, respectively. Post-war rehabilitation of cultural heritage in Bosnia was charged with a mission to mitigate the consequences of ethnic cleansing and tremendous physical losses in Bosnian historic landscapes. The heritage recovery, unique challenges in Bosnia were extremely complex. I would like just to mention uh, one of them, which was the ritual re destruction of heritage, which in almost all cases was followed with the removal of all fragments from the sites and throwing them to a kind of the heritage mass graves away from the sites, including damping sites, lakes and rivers, caves, mass graves with human corpses. Uh, the method of the Damnatio memoria was um, a tool of ethnic cleansing. Annex 8 of Dayton Accord in fact introduced it for the first time in the history of cultural heritage um, protection, uh, of, in, in, into, into the history of the conflict resolution and peace building, the cultural heritage as a paramount um, uh, factor of the peace building. The threshold in the heritage recovery policy was posted by the document on global pa partnership for the reconstruction of Old Bridge in Mostar, signed by the Director General of UNESCO, President of World Bank, and the Mayor of Mostar in 1998. This global determination to restore the site that was charged with the highest symbolic value of metaphoric bridge encourage the war torn communities to look for the restoration of the less visible ruins of heritage, their own metaphoric bridges that would bring them back to their safe homes. When the heritage focused recovery process started in 2001, the Commission to Preserve National Monuments that was established in accordance to Annex 8 of Dayton Peace Accord define the strategy of inclusive, open, integrating and participatory approach based on imperative that the work of experts should be submitted to public demands, guided by the idea of uh, David Loventhal that without public support, heritage atrophies. Beside the documentation, assessment and designation of national heritage sites, the set of actions included heritage diplomacy, public outreach through traveling exhibitions, popular and academic public publications such as greeting cards with heritage motifs and the warning on the um, risk that heritage is exposed to leaflets, posters, catalogs, magazines, press conferences. Children and youth for these projects, information sharing, mapping of diverse stakeholders and their interests, and systematic work with them as well as funds raising campaigns. Those actions were aligned with a two direction hands on transfer of knowledge from community to experts and the other way around, promoting and reviving traditions, ritual skills, vernacular knowledge, and the artistry as agents of peace building. That approach became national strategy. The participatory reconstruction as a powerful trauma healing process 
took place at hundreds of sites and tens of historic courts. I have chosen the emblematic, emblematic case of Stolets, a historic town at the World Heritage Temperative List, to briefly be presented here. After the systematic ethnic cleansing in 1993, which included leveling to the ground almost all historic structures, Stolets remained a ghost town for the next eight years. During my contacts with the uprooted community, the significance of heritage for their survival emerged. They persisted portraying their trauma through the experience of their heritage loss. We have collected their stories, testimonies, family photos, and in collaboration with them, made virtual reconstruction of the monuments which form the points of their nostalgia. And remember, it was 1993. 3D video, uh, 3D studio was in fact extremely innovative, powerful tool for this uh, 3D reconstruction. The exercise became some kind of their virtual return to home and uh, bringing back hope to them that their lives will be re-established again. We continued planning fictional recovery of Stolats. The research resulted with discovery that in an imagined perfect trauma resolution, they would insist on heritage recovery as their top priority before their homes, schools, healthcare facilities, industrial buildings. Reconstruction of the visible signs of their identity could be understood as a solid structure of their future safe reinstallment in the world. With the first discoveries of the damping sites with the fragments of monuments in 2001, their return home started through restoring the most visible signs of their attachment to the space. The site of destroyed Central Mosque became a forum where local community and their supporters from all parts of Bosnia and from abroad were undertaking almost surreal venture. Despite the political obstacles, they, with our support and help of me, my students, my colleagues, collected and reassembled fragments of the lost memory scapes. Systematic site work attracted attention and support from the other members of the community, authorities and international bodies, and the project continued as a comprehensive townscape and social recovery process. The model of restoration has been replicated in other places across Bosnia. Recovery of Stolats still goes on. Despite challenges and political traps, it has simultaneously become a laboratory of the participatory rehabilitation of heritage through um, a very important venture that is called International Summer School Youth and Heritage. The school marked 15 years of its work in 2020 with their first online uh, a sort of teaching method adapting to the new circumstances, with more than 500 students from more than 40 countries involved by now. The students learn through restoring vernacular buildings, movable heritage, skills and traditions, and the most important is that in fact these young people are uh, learning how to work with the community. And if I can stress, uh, among the uh, other extremely important outcomes and the lessons learned from the cases in Bosnia, uh, two that I consider extremely important. One is the uh, focus um, shift from the inanimate objects uh, to the people during the process of restoration, and the other is in fact shift of so-called authorized heritage discourse, as uh, Smith identifies it as a, uh, AHD, authorized heritage discourse, which is in fact, which exposes the pred predisposition of heritage professionals for tangible elite heritage and the associated widespread belief that heritage can only be properly interpreted by experts. This 
um, uh, discourse is in fact has shifted through our experience into the inclusive heritage discourse. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Amra. Thanks, thanks a lot uh, for your very, very insightful presentation. So the case of Bosnia, you have clearly highlighted how cultural heritage can be important means for social recovery process. And this has to be always borne in mind. The restoration of the central mosque, which is the most visible sign of their attachment to place became such an important source of much needed healing process following the conflict. So let me thank once again, all our panelists for their stimulating presentations. And we have received, in fact, many interesting questions and comments uh, due to limited time. It won't be possible for me to take up all these. Nevertheless, I will like to pose one question each uh, to, uh, to our panelists. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, uh, we will conclude the seminar with, uh, with those uh, questions. So let me start with the first uh, uh, question that is uh, actually for Professor Hoeda. So Professor Hoeda, the question is like this. How do you set your priorities in holistic recovery activities, like in the case study of the Beirut explosion, which was so vast? Just where do you start from? How effective were those community movements are there any plans uh, by the government or by the Solidaire to change the nature of public spaces to those uh, post-Civil War reconstructed neighborhoods? Were individuals able to trace uh, their <laughs> properties after the conflicts or it led to a collective ownership of property or common spaces? Now, this looks like you can give a whole webinar on this, but I maybe just a, just a brief uh, response to these uh, number of questions that have come up. Uh I will start with the Solidaire part and then move to the port explosion. In Solidaire, uh, no, the ownership was confiscated. People were um, kind of forced due to absence of any options to um, uh, take shares instead of their actual property. And that was part of the rupture that occurred. So people lost this connection with land. Um, so they um, were given shares and the shares have not been doing very well. So um, it was not really good for the people who were former owners. Uh, in terms of um, how do you build on, on people's use of space, Solidaire has not responded to that. It's just ongoing with its own projects, building more and more new buildings with uh, star architects like the Zaha Hadid uh, one that caught fire during the um, recent uh, events. And it's it just keeps going with its plans. And uh, it's part of a whole scheme that Mona Fawaz calls financialization of land, which has to do with really land being a commodity in this country country rather than a cultural investment. And uh, she's calling for the social value of land, which we don't really have as a practice here. Now, moving to the explosion, uh, what I recommend, of course, is we start with the people. I mean, I think we've had enough with the um, absence of the government in this country, with the civil war, it uh, abstention itself, gave it over to private uh, property, after 2006, the uh, political party of, of Hezbollah built Wad project for the people on their behalf. So again, it's another top heavy um, uh, process that didn't involve the people in the villages after 2006. It was rendered to donor countries um, who just who had a compensation scheme that was really scary. Uh, so the people were always left um, on their own. And now after the port explosion, also the government is absent. It had no strategic um, position on uh, the people who are displaced, on the heritage layer, on the re recovery itself. And the funding now, it's even uh, worse because countries, donor countries are not giving money because of the corruption in the government. So um, there is an absent government, absent donor funding, um, and the people are again left with the burden to rebuild by themselves. So this is another unique and more challenging situation. What we are doing is we are starting with the people, trying to work with them and build around the fragments that are taking place a framework that is holistic so that uh, we 
we stay long term. A lot of the people who helped were short term humanitarian or emergency repairs or medical emergencies. No one is really planning long term. Now we are partnering with UNDP, who is uh, who shares our methodology, and we are doing a bottom up recovery with the people and matching it with government uh, operations and approvals and matching it with funding. So. I hope this will end up being a successful model, but we are using citizen scientists, we are using embedded researchers, we are using community meetings, and we are coordinating with other actors. So there are a lot of small projects that are uh, in the hospital, in quarantine. So we take these small projects and engage with the actors in a discussion so that they can become part of our strategic vision. So it's a lot of coordination, and community meetings uh, uh, before the real work starts. It takes time, but I think it is the most resilient and sustainable so that the people will take ownership of it when we leave. Absolutely, oh thank you very much, Professor Eda. I mean, we look forward to the how you gain uh, further experience as you move ahead with this people-centered recovery initiative. Thank you very much. Uh, you. So, uh, so the next question is for uh, Maria. Uh, Maria, the question is, do you have inventories or databases of the cultural heritage, both tangible and intangible assets in Mosul? Do you work with any community members? How do you select and prioritize interventions? Do you connect the rehabilitation of landmarks with the intangible culture? Uh, yes. Um, okay. Um, in terms of uh, inventory, uh, we did uh, in collaboration with you and Habitat at the very beginning, um, a sort of general mapping of the level of damage uh, in the old city. This is, of course, is not limited to uh, historical landmarks, but it takes into consideration all the um, urban fabric. So also historical houses, uh, of course. Um, and it's actually uh, published as a UNESCO UN Habitat uh, framework for the old city of Mosul. Uh, I can share the link, but uh, it's, it can be downloaded online. Uh, this was done at the very beginning. And of course, it's a general uh, inventory and assessment of the level of damage and also uh, trying to understand a little bit the distribution, for example, of the, um, of the different typologies, Etc. 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 This is for tangible heritage. For intangible heritage, yes, we are working on completing an inventory of intangible heritage as well, because uh, as I was mentioning before, this project, but also the other projects uh, implemented within the framework of the initiative, all of them, they have even though working on the physical reconstruction, they have a strong component of community engagement and revitalization of um, living culture. So uh, yes, we do. Um, in terms of uh, working with community members, um, yes, um, we work with them. Uh, in particular for the project uh, on the landmark, we have some uh, permanent mechanism of coordination at the local level, which includes, of course, certain segments of the, of the, of the population. Um, then we have activated, since we are collaborating with the local organization, uh, active, especially in the field of, uh, of culture and education. So we have also been organizing um, other activities to engage the community, including larger consultations, a community survey, um, awareness raising activities, uh, focus groups. Um, of course, everything is uh, needs to be implemented. The person has been a little bit impacted during 2020 for obvious reason. Uh, but now we are trying to resume uh, also those that are more efficient, e effective if done in person and not remotely. Um, and I'm referring especially to certain segments of the population, for example, all those currently being displaced in IVP camps. 
which of course in the case of Mosul is a reality, um, of course not being able to reach them in person is a challenge in terms of engaging them because you know here now we, we think that online meetings can substitute but this is for us it's not for <laughs> the larger se segment of the population so um, this has been a, a big problem in fact for the community survey we have decided to take the risk and to reach these people even you know with uh, under uh, the pandemic but we liaise with other agencies like UNHCR working a lot with uh, with IDPs and we worked with the university and we were able to include them in the survey because we thought that this was really, really important. Otherwise, the survey would have failed. Um, and then uh, I think there was something else. Ah, uh, on how we selected the sites, maybe? This was also the last part of the question. Um, well, uh, I mean, for the for the project that I presented, so the one on the historical landmarks, this there was of course an initial consultation. Um, it's clear that in terms of, uh, and of course we wanted to work, and this was a request of the donor, but also of the government of Iraq and the local population. We wanted not only to work on um, uh, a mosque, but we wanted really to work also on other sites being uh, meaningful for other segments of the population, for example, the Christian community. And we hope that in the next future, we will be able to enlarge this intervention also to monuments which are represent, uh, representative for other minorities, for example, the Yazidis. Um, and so this was one of the key factors uh, for the selection. Um, then the selection of the exact buildings, yeah, was was decided with the with the local stakeholders because, of course, us as UNESCO, we didn't have any specific preference. Um, and I would like us to say that uh, we are not only working on landmarks, but we are also working on the rehabilitation of historical houses and their funds uh, given by the European Union. And so, of course, we don't have the funds to approach the reconstruction of the entire city of Mosul, but the selection of the houses also was done through a consultation and in order to create a synergy between the landmarks and the intervention of the, on the urban fabrics so that we could reactivate the recovery of at least a, seg a segment of the, of the old city. Thank you very much, Maria. So uh, Kai, if you can briefly respond uh, to this question about the dialogue between modern engineering and traditional knowledge that you talked about, how does the identification and inventorization of traditional knowledge be approached in your view? Oh, <laughs> the, well, it's actually interesting because we sort of sorted out how to get the political support. Uh, you know, we had the finances there, we had the community there, uh, the support, and then the question is, okay, we want to do it correctly, uh, and but then it that was became the problem. So how do you do something, you know, the, let's say a reconstruction of a monument correctly? Uh, then the question started arising. I think it's then the process of dialogue and of getting people together and of compromising, which then becomes important. And I think that is uh, the process which we need to carry out. There aren't sort of fixed solutions. And I think that was what uh, sort of came out of uh, this whole process where we you know, got the artisans and the engineers together. And uh, then we said, okay, the artisans will tell us how they want to build it. And then we test it through the engineers, but the language is different. You know? So the engineers sort of have to model it and sort of do reverse engineering Well. The artisans say, oh, we start building and the materials will tell us how we continue. And the dialogue was very difficult to bring the, the two together and even the language is different. However, I think that's where we need to work on how the, the communication works. And, uh, and I think it's that process and you know, it's no use taking shortcuts or saying, oh, these are, this is how it's going to be done. We just need to get everyone together. And, 
and uh, and I think that's some uh, a process that everyone uh, needs to go to go through, and uh, and that's where you find the solutions. Thanks. Thank you. Well said, Kai. So, Paula, for you, uh, the the earthquake in Italy that you talked about, which occurred on April uh, two thousand and nine. Uh, following that uh, disaster, what measures have cultural institutions developed to create a task force for future uh, damages and casualties? The reconstructions always take a long time and is unclear how is being implemented by the government and cultural heritage sector. For example, the last big earthquake in Mexico City and Puebla on September 2017 was very devastating and, uh, and a good lesson to understand the risks within countries in Latin America and Caribbean islands. How much communication has this, uh, uh, you know, like how, how do you communicate these lessons learned for the future? Okay, um, I have to say that the Italian um, structure and the government immediately set the task force that uh, work in the different sectors and the Minister of uh, Cultural um, Heritage and, and, and uh, how say, Architecture um, Heritage immediately set a commission that is working with experts from different fields, trying, uh, let's say, to establish uh, a good, a proper protocol and processes, etc. I cannot say that in Italy we are lacking of knowledge about it, um, especially for the fact that, for instance, in L'Aquila, in the center of L'Aquila, the 70% of the historical monuments and heritage were within the historical city. Um, the problem is not, um, let's say, is not the committee, is not the knowledge, are not experts. The problem is how you can deal with um, towns, money, and uh, other, other factors. And especially what is your uh, prioritization. Uh, let me give just an example. Uh, the monument that was the cathedral, um, the, the dome of Enzone, that was the symbol for Friuli earthquake, was rebuilt. Uh, earthquake was in 1976, and it was uh, rebuilt stone by stone between 1988 and 1995. Basilica di Cole was rebuilt in less than 10 years with the highest uh, knowledge and skill. So uh, it depends really, but uh, again, it's not a matter of task forces. <laughs> the task force is there. They have high knowledge. They know what to do. Right. Thank Problem you is much. political, not yeah. knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Sorry to say. <laughs> uh, thanks, Paola. Amra, for you, a very, very challenging question about funding. Uh, for the, even if we recognize and the community recognizes that uh, that uh, heritage recovery is very important. Often the priority is made by the of officially on other sectors and not heritage. And so heritage sector, the sector is always struggling to find money to do the recovery uh, in many instances. So uh, what in your experience, through your experience can be, a, can be an arrangement that can be made in advance so that we can really address this funding issue with regards to reconstruction efforts for heritage. Thank you, Rohit. And it's really extremely challenging question. And uh, the uh, case of Bosnia, in fact, shows that understanding post-conflict uh, situation, that is, in fact, trauma afterlife, in which uh, community is in the focus and their needs should be in the focus of all the plans, is, in fact, one of those that um, uh, shows that sometimes we come to the sites, to the nations affected by the war or by disaster with some kind of ready-made um, uh, approaches, which are not always uh, approaches that respond to the context and to the need of the community affected. So in Bosnia, it took like eight years to convince 
uh, donors, international community, because the country was without its own budget. It was totally destroyed. The institutional framework was destroyed. Everything was destroyed. To convince those who were planning uh, recovery, comprehensive recovery, that cultural heritage and the recovery of the identity that is some kind of um, a tool to help people to regain their uh, sort of identity and to uh, uh, transfer from the the humanized condition into some kind of the uh, regained uh, right to be reinstalled to the world um, it took a lot of time so uh, cultural heritage advocacy is extremely important working with the politicians and decision makers it is, is extremely important but the funding possibilities are diverse and it is very important to go and start working with the community and in fact to develop the projects in which the community in which the local people local experts communities local enterprises are in fact working the skills should not be imported because this in fact, develops ownerships and makes all the projects cheaper. So when this uh, sort of uh, encouragement comes and the uh, capacity building projects are focused to raising capacities of the local um, uh, sort of institutions and local frameworks to undertake the projects through quick hands-on training and uh, supporting them to produce the local materials to uh, find the solutions, then also makes the funding uh, sort of more sustainable and better. There are a lot of uh, sort of modes, models. One of them is a small revolving fund for the heritage that is not the highest uh, iconic level of heritage that attracts funding from different kind of European Union, World Bank, etc. So it means uh, establishing a small fund for the small borrowing to the owners of the historic houses, etc., to uh, make it easier for them to recover the houses and producing the conditions for them uh, to bring the money back in a way that is comfortable without interest rate you know in some kind of so that this fund is always revolved and able to you know borrow again these amounts to the others and there are different uh, sort of different of other opportunities but once when the project starts it by itself attracts the money and the case of Stolex is one of them it was really generated without any kind of funds but then it was supported by European Commission and the other funds. Then they, when the people saw that it has a potential to uh, sort of uh, be the agent of the full recovery and reconciliation. Thank you so much, Amra, for explaining how we can really address this issue of funding from your own direct experience. This is very, very useful. Uh, there's one last comment I'll make uh, before I wrap up, and that's very interesting. It's actually addressed to Amra's presentation only. People who live during long periods of war, their memory of the city is military points and destruction. How can we ask them to prioritize uh, building reconstruction, how can we engage them in reconstruction or ask them what kind of heritage they want to go back to if they never knew the city before war? Uh, for example, in Syria, it is 11 years of war now and we have a whole generation who have no memory of the landmarks and heritage of the city. So I think this is also a very real, real challenge uh, that, uh, that we face when we are recovering from a long drawn conflict situations. So thank you very much to all the panelists. So there, uh, we are now approaching the end of our uh, uh, webinar. It has taken a little bit longer than what we had planned, but I think we had such interesting discussions. Uh, so it was worth having uh, continue, continue for a little longer. I would uh, again express my gratitude to all the panelists and also our organizing team here at ECROM that has been uh, working hard to bring this uh, webinar and the others to you. 
ICROM is dedicated towards developing a capacity building framework for recovery of cultural heritage following disasters and conflict, basing it on its current program in Mosul. And we will continue to share with you the lessons learned from the field through our activities. Uh, I would also like to thank the attendees uh, for participating in the webinar and for raising important questions. Uh, the recorded version of this webinar will be shortly made available on our YouTube channel, link to our website, Please note that the recordings of all the previous webinars are also available at ECROM lecture series page. Uh, information on our future webinars is made available at our website under ECROM lecture series and also on other social media platform. I also take this opportunity to announce and I would like request uh, my colleague to share the poster. Uh, our next webinar on integrated heritage management linking nature, culture in the framework of the World Heritage Leadership and the Panorama Nature Culture Thematic Community. This webinar will be in Spanish and will be held on 25th March uh, at 4 p.m. Uh, Central European time. Uh, so uh, with this, I would like to thank you all for being with us for this webinar. Thank you again to all the panelists and uh, please stay safe, stay healthy until we meet each other again. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.